We're going to go into more detail on some of these topics later today, but I want to talk about some treating cycles, uh, some of the chemistry that we use, and some of your jobs as treaters to make sure that we get proper retention and penetration during the treatment cycles. So the first is the um, various types of treatment cycles that, that can be used to treat wood. Matt mentioned the Bethel process, that's the full cell process that's used when full initial vacuum, typically defined as greater than 22 inches of mercury, is um, pulled on the cylinder prior to treatment. Uh, there's a modified cell in which you use full vacuum, but um, at a lower amount of vacuum than 22 inches of mercury. And then two others, grouping and uh, empty cell processes. Empty cell processes are used with um, initial atmospheric pressure, so just no, no pressure, no vacuum at the beginning of the treatment cycle prior to treatment. And grouping cycle is done with air pressure, so positive air pressure on the cylinder prior to introduction of the treatment solution. And we'll tell you later today how that affects penetration and um, the treatment and the uptake of, of the treated wood. <coughs> the, when we talk about retention, retention is calculated according to the formula of solution uptake, and the solution uptake is under your control as treaters, depending on what treatment cycle you use, how much pressure, how much initial vacuum, how much final vacuum is used, and the solution concentration, which is also under your control, so uh, you know, your mix levels, the mix systems that we, that we provide you to use, um, determine your, or are used to give you a desired solution concentration, you multiply that by your expected solution uptake, and that gives you your expected retention. Some systems, if there are any creosote treaters in the room, um, some systems we don't really think of it as a um, treatment solution concentration because the creosote itself is, is, is the active. So as I talk about some of this stuff, you know, there's that little exception that we don't think of solution concentration when we're talking about some systems. So I want to talk about AWPA a little bit. It's related to, to some of the um, topics I just introduced. The two important quality parameters are penetration and retention. So penetration is the uh, depth of <coughs> ingress that the preservative system has on, on the treated piece of wood. Um, yeah, and that's under your control, as I mentioned, based on initial vacuum, pressure treatment, you know, amount of pressure, time of pressure, amount of final vacuum, that is um, all under your control. And the retention can be, can be adjusted also in part by the treating cycle and predominantly by making adjustments to the solution concentration depending on your goals. As far as the standards for this, um, AWPA has two primary standards that are used, that we use when we're thinking about quality control and what are the requirements for our treated wood. Uh, the first standard is AWPA U1, that uh, is the use category system, and it gives the specified retention that varies by commodity, it varies by species, um, you know, end use, use application. Um, those desired retentions are defined in AWPA U1. And then how we monitor that is defined in AWPA T1. So we have an, an assay zone. Well, how do you know what the assay zone is? Is it six tenths of an inch, or is it one, is it one inch? Well, that depends, on, again, on commodity, on the, on the dimension of the treated piece, and um, all that information is located in AWPA T1. Back on this um, calculation here. Belinda, am I messing you up? I'm sorry. No, you're good. Uh, back on this calculation of retention is solution uptake times concentration. So retention, we've talked about, is the amount of chemical that's absorbed by the wood. Um, and it, that's usually defined in an assay zone. So it shows the active ingredients that are present in the, in the assay zone is how that's reported. In the US, the units are typically in, in PCF, which is pounds per cubic foot. It's just the division of the pounds of chemical divided by the cubic feet, the volume uh, of the wood expressed in cubic feet. Um, it can also be done in kilograms per cubic meter, so on the local system. Um, kilograms per cubic meter is used instead of pounds per cubic foot, but it's the same idea as mass divided by volume, and the conversion factor is about 16, if anyone uses that. For uh, solution uptake, we talked about this before, this is the weight gain of the piece as a result of the treatment. Um, typically, I think of that in PCF. I know a lot of you think of that in gallons per cubic foot, so that conversion is depends on the weight of the treating solution, but maybe 8.5, 8.4, 8.5 um, gallons to get to pounds. And again, that varies. That's a, um, something that we can control as part of the treating process. 
to um, make sure that we get that uptake properly controlled. Solution concentration then, we think of the um, active ingredients that are in the treating solution itself. Uh, we think of the active ingredients, so if you're treating copper so we're thinking of copper, tet, and pro. Um, other, you know, CCA, we think in oxide pounds in, uh, for the three components of CCA. So this is under your control as the treating plant. Our root system will help, will help you do this. Um, I know we've got some presentation. John may be giving it later today uh, about how you change your solution concentration. You know, you've got 15,000 gallons in your tank at such and such concentration. How you go up to 20,000 gallons at a different concentration. We, um, we'll talk about that math later today. Mm. So the AWPA is the organization that, again, that writes these two main standards that we use in our industry, U1 and T1. Um, it's an international body. It's primarily a standards writing body. I think Matt mentioned that it was founded in 1904. Anti-accredited, um, the membership at the AWPA is quite varied. We've got um, producers like us, treaters like you, end users, general interest users. Uh, the building, building code ICC has representation there. Um, academics, universities who study wood and forestry are also present and are experts and give us input on our industry. Uh, four primary types of standards. There are preservative standards. Those, they're called P standards. If you've ever flipped through the book, they're called P standards. They give like the definition of the preservative. So what is copper azol? It's a 25 to 1 ratio of copper to azol. And any, you know, it's waterborne and you use for pressure treatment or all that is defined in these key standards, the definition of the preservative. How do you analyze it? So um, analytical methods is the second, another type of standard. So um, if you guys all use, light, you know, if you have laboratories at your treating plants, the XRX, the procedures that are in the XRF are covered by an AWP standard. When you send your samples to us, we analyze them in our LAS lab. We're using AWP standards for, for the analysis of the treating solution and the treated Inspection requirements in PC are also defined um, in what we call miscellaneous standards in the book. And then evaluation standards, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, are the uh, uh, test methods that our RD group uses to determine what should be the proper retentions, what are the proper chemical mixtures that should be used in these preservatives. As far as the committee breakdown, there's a committee for every everything that you can imagine in the treated wood industry. We have a, a committee for that in AWPA. <laughs> Uh, you can see some of the examples on here. So oil-borne preservatives have their own group of experts to talk about that talk about those preservatives. Waterborns have their own group of experts to talk about those preservatives. The analytical, there's, um, there's an analytical group, there's an evaluation group, and you see even some non-biocidal non groups that talk about um, coatings or other, other means besides pesticides that can be used to, to help prevent um, threats to treat wood or to, or to wood. So that's on the P side. On the T side, we talk more about applications. And uh, so groups on here, it's more organized by commodities. So there's lumber and timber, poles, piles, et cetera. Pl you know, plywood doesn't, it's not specifically included, but it's got um, this T8 composites and manufactured products that plywood is a category underneath. And then some special committees on research, another interest of AWPA is to make sure that the industry, the AWPA is for our communication and that the industry is up to date on current research and current trends. So the commodities that, the use categories <coughs> that, that um, are important are probably familiar to all of you, but I thought I'd review them. So they start at one and go up to five. There's also a fire retardant um, use category. One is really, is a low threat. It's for an interior dry application. Two is an interior wedge or like dammed application, but this would be like sill plate on the, on the bottom of the house where typically you expect it to be dry, but I guess you might see a little dampness or moisture. But really the threat is not high. It's not going to be repeatedly, repeatedly wet, exposed to soil, exposed to the outdoors. Use category three is above ground exterior that's subdivided into what's uh, called UC3A and UC3B. A is protected. So if it's coated or protected from the building architecture from the elements, then it's UC3A. And that's a slightly lower threat than UC3B, which is above ground but exposed to the elements. That would be a deck or uh, a fence board, a deck board or something like that, where it's going to be hit hit with the hit with the elements. 
East category four is also subdivided into, into um, <coughs> several subcategories. <coughs> UC four is for, is for ground contact. Um, there's a uh, 4A, which is general use, and then 4B and 4C, which are more heavy duty use. Uh, they vary again by application and even geography. Utility poles, the designation of um, UC4, whether it's A, B, or C, depends on, ge on geography and location. Use category 5 is for marine use, and there's a fire department use specified in the as well. So as far as some of the testing, I said I wanted to talk about the evaluation methods and how we even get to these numbers. How do you know you're supposed to treat 0.15? How right <coughs> um, These are this is done through these evaluation methods that I described that are that exist in the AWPA. Lanza has a, an R&D group that maintains field sites, field sites, and performs testing on the treated wood products to determine these levels of efficacy. <coughs> uh, quite a variety of tests exist. And I'll show you some pictures of what some of these look like. There's uh, tree, or turbine resistance. Field stakes is really the primary ground contact efficacy test. L joints, soil blocks, and you can, you can read the others. About the primary above ground test is called the lap joint test. And I think I've got a picture of that in here. Yeah, so this is the horizontal lap joint test. This is the primary test that's used to determine the Retention that's required for an above ground for an above ground setting. Um, it's two pieces of wood that a small joint is, is created between them, and then they're they're bolted together. And then every year that bolt is undone, and you the idea is that you have a joint. If you if you're building a deck structure, you have a handrail or something like that. It would have some sort of a joint on it, and inside that joint is where it's likely to collect water, you know, debris, dirt, where the decay threat is highest. And so we break that apart and we evaluate the decay inside that joint. That's done annually, and we submit that data to AWPA to get an improved retention. This test is called an L joint test. You can see it's a 90 degree angle. This is used heavily in the, in the window and door industry. So I've talked about AWPA. We also participate in an organization called WDMA, which is the Window and Door Manufacturers Association. This test is used heavily by that organization. Uh, they're coated or primed pieces at a 90 degree angle, and it's a similar concept to what I described before in the lap joints, is that every year that joint is split. So on your window, Mike had talked about that he had some rot on a window. So you split, it's covered by that primer, but at that joint where it's collecting water and debris, you evaluate the decay <laughs> hazard, and um, again, that's done annually, annually monitored over time for a variety of chemical mixtures at a variety of these levels. To find the right one. Um, ground proximity testing. This is um, you can imagine a lot of wood, a lot of treated wood is used in this in this sort of setting for uh, anything that's near the ground but uh, but above ground but in a ground contact type case. This ground box test is is um, is what's used for that. These are field stakes. If you see here, uh, we've got a bunch of stakes sitting in the ground. Those are evaluated. Annually, they're just pulled out of the ground and again evaluated for decay. Um, de decay tends to occur at the ground line and in, in the vicinity of the ground line. So, some of the pictures Mike has showed you about that decay, that heavy decay can occur at the ground line and evaluated in this, in this field state test. <clears throat> so, last little bit on AWPA is that everything that, that goes into the book has to be acted upon by a committee. So, we've got all these committees with jurisdiction on all the different things that I talked about a few slides ago. Um, and you know, the competitors are in the room, the trainers are in the room, the authorities are, you know, regulators, the building code has representation in the room, and so all this is discussed in an open way to, to gain approval. Uh, all the chemical properties you see on the, on the um, right hand side, all the different properties of the preservative of the treated wood are all evaluated by, by AWPA. And we go back every five years. For our preservative standards, we go back every five years with fresh data and say, hey, there's, the stuff still works, or here are the updates, here are the things that need to happen um, for everyone to still feel comfortable. Okay, so moving on, Matt talked a little bit about early efforts for the protection of treated wood. Uh, he talked a lot about, I noticed, organic treatments, so olive oil and creosote, tar. Um, 
we know we know the transition metals are also really good fungicides and, and teridicides, so that's why <coughs> a lot of us use arsenic, zinc, copper in you know chromium in the treatments that we use. So some early efforts had um, similar ideas: mercuric chloride, copper sulfate, as you see on here, zinc chloride. So just transition metal salts were used to try to impregnate wood. Before the pressure treatment process was invented, uh, some folks would cut the tree. And, you know, trees, it's called transpiration. They absorb moisture from, from the surrounding soil. So they would cut the trees and then place them like Christmas tree style into a pan of copper sulfate and allow the tree to, to absorb the copper sulfate up through its normal transpiration process while it, was still, while it was still living to get that copper onto the interior of the wood. Hmm. Cool. So, again, Matt talked about this. In 1838, John Bethel came up with the Bethel process. This was the, uh, the full cell process. And if you all remember, the full cell process is when you take initial vacuum greater than 22 inches of mercury at the beginning of the, of the treatment cycle. It was used for coal tar treatments for, um, that, was the, that was the primary preservative used at the time. We hadn't come along yet to invent copper azol. That came, that came later. And these pieces were, were placed in, in hot oil, like think of like French fry style. So you're cooking the trees for, like French fries in hot oil and, uh, and treating, treating them in that way. The industry expanded in the 1900s. Again, Matt talked about the founding of AWS <coughs> in 1904. Uh, Forest Products Lab in Wisconsin was founded at around that same time. Um, Creosote gained favor. And then additional processes, we'll talk about the um, lottery process and the roofing process. I mentioned it before that those types of treatment processes that begin at either atmospheric air or with initial air pressure are used to reduce the <coughs> uptake of the preservative. Um, and so that reduces cost. And so as those innovations came, then cost, cost came more in line and the preservative wood was able to be used more frequently. So I want to talk about a couple of ways to categorize treated wood. Um, this slide talks about oil borns versus water borns. That's a common way that we differentiate types of treated wood. Oil borns include um, copper naphthenate, pentachlorophenol, creosote. Water borns are copper azole, CCA. ACCA is an industrial marine approved treatment that's, that's a water borne. And there are some metal free and a couple of others that, that we'll go through as we, as we talk. Creosote has continued widespread use in the USA, and it's one of the few preservatives that's approved for marine use. Um, it's used on utility poles, railroad ties, docks, bridges, and uh, some treaters are also adding borings as either a one or two step option. The creosote tends to treat the, the outer region of, of the piece, and um, borings are used to help migrate some preservative protection for the interior region of, of that piece. <laughs> Panel was developed in 1930. It, it's uh, heavily used in the utility pole industry, but also in cross arms and pilings, and has ground contact and freshwater use, but no, no saltwater marine use. And then two other oil boards are copper naphthene and copper eight, and um, those are used for both pressure and non-pressure. Copper eight can be used for, as a an end cut solution, so we, we advise, we our warranty requires that <coughs> during installation, any cut ends are, are covered with an with, uh, end cut solution, that's copper eight that, that's being applied there. So these have pressure and non-pressure uses, and copper naphthenate is not a restricted use pesticide, that's a, a topic we'll come to later. <coughs> the uh, pentachlorophenol and creosote were restricted use pesticides, and so copper naphthenate is an example of an oil form that, that is not. On the waterborns, CCA has gone through several iterations in its life. So there was type A. CCA is copper chromate and arsenate, by the way. And then the dash C means that we're on type C right now. So there was a type A and a type B in years past. And now we're on type C, and all this is is variations in the ratios of um, chromium to copper to arsenic. So the type C ratio is shown here. Uh, it's been used for almost a century now and has ground contact and freshwater and saltwater uses. So CC is the second one um, that I've mentioned. 
Yeah, I haven't gotten to ACCA yet. Yeah, so copper, or CCA is the second one that I've mentioned that has saltwater uses. Um, and it was most of the residential market prior to about 20 years ago. But we all know that's no longer the case since the market has moved to um, copper organic based preserving systems. Uh, and it's still heavily used on holes and potholes. ACCA is our third preservative that's suitable for use in, in marine applications. It's ammoniacal copper zinc arsenate. So the three active ingredients are copper zinc and arsenic in the ratio that, I, that I've shown here. This also is an old preservative. <coughs> it's developed as AC, ACA. So no zinc, this is a, again 100 years ago that this preservative was, was developed. Zinc was added later, and um, it's used again on marine piling, and then it's useful in duck fur and in, in hardwoods like uh, white oak in, in its house of use. ACQ on the waterborne side, there are four ACQs. So after the, the residential market shifted off CCA, then copper-based preservatives were, were being developed. Um, copper on its own might be <coughs> some illusion to this. Copper on its own is a great fungicide and terminicide, but there are some organisms that survive even in the presence of copper. They're called copper-tolerant copper -tolerant organisms. So, the first, so we have to add cobiocides to the, to the copper-containing treatment solution because the copper on its own will protect the wood. So initially, the um, cobiocide that was added were quaternary ammonium compounds, and that gave us a preservative system called the ACQ. There are four versions of this, and you can see the differences here. Uh, they vary in the ratio. It's expressed as, as copper oxide to quat of some component, and that ratio between copper and quat varies, as you, as you see. Um, type A is 50% copper, and it's expressed on an oxide basis, um, and then the rest are 60, you know, two-thirds copper oxide. And then the, the quat is the other differentiator between the four types of ACQ, uh, whether it's TDAC or BAC. And then type B, the copper is dissolved in ammonia, and the others it's dissolved in the Initially, this preservative system, if any of you were around when ACQ was um, in widespread use, and especially when it was initially released, it used to be based on chloride quats, so this is DDA chloride. And chloride is an ion that causes a lot of corrosion on fasteners and hardware that are used in, in uh, construction, and it can even be corrosive in, in treatment plant equipment. And so long since innovation that improved ACQ was the, develop, the development of the carbonate quat. So instead of the anion being chloride, it was carbonate, which is non corrosive, and that was an improvement to this. Copper azole is in, is in widespread use today. There are two types, type B and type C. Uh, both of them are 25 to 1 copper to azole. This is expressed on a copper metal basis. This is another feature of AWPA when we define these preservatives. I mentioned that ACQ is defined on a copper oxide basis. Um, copper azole is defined on a copper metal basis, so all that information is available. Copper azole is 25 copper to 1 azole is the ratio. And the difference between type B and type C is that type B is all tebiconazole as the azole component, and type C is a half and half mixture of tebiconazole and propiconazole, still adding up to 1 25th of the copper amount. Um, copper azole is available in two varieties. There's a dissolved variety in amine or, or ammonia, um, and then there's a micronized variety in which the copper is present as a copper mineral that's ground to a small enough particle size that, that it can penetrate wood. So what's described on this slide then is four different preservative systems, uh, dissolved and micronized, type B e and type C. So all four are, are available, all four are approved by AWPA and International Building Code. Two metal-free preservatives are on the market. Um, <coughs> Those are PTI, which is propiconazole, tebiconazole, and imidacloprid. The propiconazole, again, are the fungicides that we use in our copper azole. And then for termite protection, since we don't have copper in these preservatives, for termite protection, an ingredient called imidacloprid is used. And um, these metal-free preservatives are both for above-ground use only, so they're not suitable for ground contact applications. Um, our PTI product is AWPA and WDMA approved. 
WBBA is the organization I mentioned before that we go and coordinate that business association. EL2 is a competitive metal free, metal free formula, is DCOI plus immune cloprid for the same reasons so the DCOI is there as the fungicide, and the immune cloprid is added for termite and insect use. Um, again, another above ground use that's APP. And then a couple others that you may have heard of or may have heard about components of, but that are not have not really found widespread use. Um, and those are copper HDO and um, the KBS series and KBS and KBS dash B. Similar, if you look at the details here, it's kind of similar ideas to what I described for ACQ and copper ASALT are copper-based preservatives, and then just with other um, probiocytes. So again, ACQ is quads. Copper azole is azole, and so other ingredients can be used as that organic probiotic. Okay, as far as treatment additives, so that's um, what I have to say on the preservative side, but we all know that we have multi component mixtures, especially in residential plants. And so the other components that are added are moldicides, that's to control mold growth on the surface of the wood after treatment. So the active ingredients that we use in general are OIT and then the CMIT-MIT combination. So there are isothiazolone chemistry, and again, used in small amounts in the treatment solution to control surface mold after treatment on the wet on the wet on the earth. Colorants have, have grown in popularity and can be used in both dissolved and uh, micronized copper azole. So we have in silver colorants. Pre-stains are shown later on the slide, but some, some customers, especially in the West, use pre-stains uh, whereby the wood is kind of painted with this pre-stain coating prior to treatment, and then uh, the treatment comes on as a second step. Defoamer, corrosion inhibitor, you may have um, some of these ingredients separately in your plants, and we formulate our products to include, include these where possible. Water implants, our product is Lumbrella. Uh, Umbrella Plus and Umbrella Plus V2 are the, are the current products. Um, they're used, again, in cylinder additives for the, for the treatment solution. They help limit the absorption and release of water from the wood to help dimensional stability and reduce checking and cracking during, uh, during initial service. And then the surface treatment products, again, Matt mentioned a couple of these. They're used as uh, shorter term mold protection and surface treatment. Uh, for surface treatment uses, um, our products are anti glue, uh, the microstep line from our friends at Diacon, and, and um, Frank Gar. Okay, next I want to talk about um, some regulatory matters, and we're going to get a lot more detail on this later today from the guys and gals in regulatory. So I talked about one way of categorizing of splitting preservatives is between water ports and oil ports. Another way to think switch perspectives and think from the regulatory side. Another way to categorize preservatives is whether they are restricted use or um, unclassified or general use by US EPA. So the preservatives I talked about already, the restricted use pesticides are CCA, ACCA, creosote, and PETA. And it's those restricted use pesticides that cause the need for pesticide applicator licenses that have to be removed every year, and that's the reason that many of us are in this group. Other uh, uses are, or other preservatives are just classified as general use. And that's a little awkward to talk about, actually. So EPA doesn't, doesn't name a preservative your general use. They just don't say anything about it at all. So if EPA just a, does, does not give the designation, then by default it's, it's general use or just unclassified. So they only designate the, um, the roughs. So the copper azoles, the ACQs, the metal freeze that I talked about, and then the two, <coughs> two other oil forms are copper naphthenate and copper eight. Those are um, general use pesticides. So on the, on the restricted use pesticide um, side of things, the product, if the product is identical or substantially similar to something that's already registered and classified as restricted use pesticide, then that new product will also obtain that same designation. And um, if it's something that's unrelated to something that exists already, then the toxicity is evaluated. And that toxicity meets certain thresholds that are specified in the Code of Federal Regulations, which are very interesting. Um, then the product will be classified as, as restricted use. When that's the case, then there are certain labeling requirements. And we're going to go into a lot of detail on this later this, after, later this afternoon. Um, 
And the details in the Code of Federal Regulation are detailed enough that they specify font size, placement, uh, placement on the label, to make sure that all this information is properly communicated. Um, and as I mentioned, rubs are not available. All of our products, by the way, are sold according to only applicators with the pesticide applicator license. So many of you in the room are certified applicators. And so part of this seminar and part of your job is to, make, to know how to apply these restricted use pesticides properly. Um, minimum standards for competency are set by EPA, and again, mentioned in the, in the CFR. That's the reason for the sign-in sheet, <coughs> the importance of attendance, and things like that. Um, it's the document that this training has occurred and that you are here. Certification is completed at the state level, so that's why the state information is important for everybody. So the EPA sets the thresholds, and then the states are the, are the enforcers. And um, we have to have a, a certified applicator in every state where the restricted use pesticide is used. All right, pesticide, it has, I don't know, some people at least think that pesticide has sort of a, a negative connotation. Um, you know, people don't want chemicals in their lives and things like that. Um, there's one, I don't know if you guys have seen this TV commercial, there's a, a TV commercial that said, where like they're, the, they're cleaning the toilet and one, one, one person's going to use like lemon juice or something like that, you know, it's all healthy and, and nice. And then the other one's like, you need, do you know what happens in there? You need bleach. So sometimes we just need the good chemicals, I think. And uh, so I think, that, I think that a lot for our industry. Uh, pesticide is not a bad word. They serve a great useful function. They prevent a lot of the effects that Mike talked about. We use them all over. So if you use the, the sanitizer wipes on your kitchen counter, that contains um, pesticide ingredients. So it's just anything that, that kills harmful creatures that exist in our environment, then it's classified as a pesticide. So the very common usages and a lot of good things come from pesticides. So we don't let that word scare us. As far as toxicity of pesticides, that can vary from one product to another. The uh, toxicity categories are, there are four of them, and they rank in increasing um, hazard, let's say. So ca toxicity category four is really no, no special restriction, and then the categories go up. Category one is the most severe, uh, for the most severe toxicity threat. When we register a pesticide, we have to submit toxicity testing to EPA, and it's something that we call six-pack tox testing. So there are six tests that have to be conducted, and they're shown here for the different types of exposure that you may have when you're handling or using the pesticide. So oral inhalation, skin contact, eye contact, things like that are all, are all tested on our products. And then depending on the results, um, the sensitization, the sixth one, the sensitization, the results of that test do not affect the, the final signal word that goes on the product. So there are six tests that we perform, but five of them <coughs> matter for the um, final designation of the product. And so it depends. As you see here, there are the four categories that I mentioned before for the five different tests, depending on those results, then your product, your product is classified. And I mentioned that the categories, category one is the most severe toxicity threat, and that kind of makes sense. If you look at oral, like if you eat the stuff, don't eat our products, by the way, please. <laughs> but if you eat the stuff, if it takes 5,000 milligrams per kilogram of your body weight to kill you, then it's only a category four. But like if you have to eat less of it for it to kill you, then it's more toxic. So that's what this, that's what this chart is saying. Okay? Don't eat these stuff. Please. As far as the, the labeling requirements, as I mentioned, uh, Terry, I don't know if this is in Terry's presentation or, or Mike's. Okay. So our regulatory <coughs> folks are going to go through this in more detail. But if you have a restricted use pesticide, then there are certain labeling requirements. And you can see, they'll show you a, be a better pic picture here, but CCA is sold under our trade name Woman Act, if you use CCA. Um, and that's an example of a restricted use pesticide. It has this box here and this red skull and crossbones. Again, please don't eat this stuff. Uh, so it's got the rub statement, and then as all labels do, safety requirements, PPE, um, disposal, <laughs> pressure and things like that. So just contrast that, I've got another label here that's not a restricted use pesticide. So again, the primary features are in this middle panel, the, the rub statement here, and then the skull and crossbones. Just if I go to copper all, you see that those um, designations on the label are no longer present because this is an unrestricted or un, what do they call it, unclassified general use 
um, labeled. But all the other parts of the label are, are there, and our four-year information and our two and our two followers. Okay, so how do we limit? You guys are operate treating plants, and you must have safety programs in place. How do we limit the exposure of either the pesticides that we use or the treated wood? How do we limit that exposure to the environment and people? What are some things you can do in your plant to limit this exposure? Holler it out. I know you. I know you have some ideas. How do we keep people from coming into contact with these chemicals? Containment. Good. That's a good idea. What else? PPE. PPE. Nice. What else? Engineering controls. Engineering controls. Good. Um, safe handling procedures, and then housekeeping was the other one I, I thought of that, that, I didn't, that I didn't hear here. Okay. Um, so wrapping this up then, our job as the chemical supplier, your job as the treater, is to make sure that the wood is treated so that it's suitable for its end use. So we have to know, um, we want to know how the user is going to use the wood and make sure that it has enough chemical and the right amount of chemical for that purpose. Um, we want to make sure that the wood contained, the quality of the wood is proper, so the chemical has to be has to be present in the right assay zone, has to be present in the right amount, so the penetration depth has to be has to be proper. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that, that both of us are, do, are doing our jobs. Matt talked about the live wood campaign and covered a lot of these points already. Um, wood is treated, the point is that we don't put chemicals out into the environment, out into our lives unnecessarily. We treat the wood so that it's suitable for its end use, and every step along the way is planned and controlled. And that's part of, the, part of the purpose of this seminar is to make sure that, that all of those steps are running, are running properly, and that you and I, you and Monza, are all properly communicated on how it's supposed to work and what's supposed to be done. So with that, I conclude, and I thank you all. If, any, if there are any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you, Jay.